وَاسْمُ قَوَّامِينَ لِلَّهِ شُهَدَاءَ بِالْقِسْقُ وَلَا يَجْرِمَنَّكُمْ شَنَآنُ قَوْمٍ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوهُ اعْدِلُوهُ وَأَقْرَبُ لِلتَّقْوَىٰ وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ Thank you, Ami. Um, and the English translation of this is, O oh, you who have believed, be persistently standing firm for Allah, witnesses and justice, and do not let the hatred of a people prevent you from being just. Be just, that is nearer to righteousness, and fear Allah. Indeed, Allah is acquainted with what you do. So, um, I'd like to begin with, um, once again, welcoming you all to this uh, session today about Just Mercy. And um, we are excited to have Mr. Lampley here today. And um, I can just reiterate how I crossed paths with him. Um, uh, earlier this year, I was um, asked to give a Vesper at the Zion Baptist Church. And um, Mr. Lampley was the guest speaker, and um, I was just uh, really, really moved about how he spoke of Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream. And um, while much of his dream has been realized, he also pointed out um, how much work uh, we still have left to do um, in this country. So I'm going to read a bio of Mr. Lampley, and um, you'll see why we feel so honored to have him join us today. Nathaniel Lampley Jr. is a native of Hamilton, Ohio. He graduated from Hamilton High School in 1981 in the top 1% of his class with a 3.95 grade point average. He received an academic scholarship from the University of Dayton where he graduated with honors in 1985. He earned additional money for college working as a laborer at the Beckett Paper Company when he was on summer breaks. He received a full scholarship from the University of Cincinnati College of Law, from which he get graduated with honors in 1988. While in law school, Mr. Lampley worked as a legal intern at the Butler County Prosecutor's Office. He currently serves as a managing partner of the Cincinnati office of Boris, Sater, Seymour, and Pease LLP, a full service law firm with nearly 400 lawyers and offices in seven US cities. Mr. Lankley is a trial lawyer. His practice includes complex litigation, employment litigation, commercial litigation, and wrongful death litigation. He has tried cases in state and federal courts involving trade secrets, intellectual property, dissenting shareholder suits, products liability, and mass tort cases. Among his civic activities and community service, Mr. Lankley has served on the boards of the Cincinnati Black Ambassadors, the Black Lawyers Association of Cincinnati, the Christ Hospital Sports Medicine Institute, Downtown Cincinnati, Volunteer Lawyers for the Poor, the University of Cincinnati College of Law Board of Visitors, the Salvation Army, and the University of Cincinnati Alumni Association. He has, he has participated in Leadership Cincinnati, the Cincinnati Academy of Leadership for Lawyers, and the United Way Volunteer Leaders Development Program. He delivered the commencement address for Hamilton High School in 2002 and 2013. Mr. Lampley has been honored in the Cincinnati Business Career's 40 Under 40, Who's Who in Black Cincinnati, and has been recognized as an Ohio super lawyer in litigation every year since 2004. Mr. Lampley was recently selected for the 2020 University of Cincinnati College of Law Distinguished Alumni Award. He is the son of Nathaniel Lampley Sr. and the late Ma Marina Lampley. He has been married to Paula Davis Lampley since 1992. They have two sons who graduated from St. Xavier High School, Nathaniel III, Trey, who was a graduate of Washington University in St. Louis and a second year medical student at the University of Cincinnati College of Medicine, and Hunter, who is a senior at St. Louis University where he studies management and technology. So once again, um, I would uh, like to welcome Mr. Lampley, our honored guest. And before I ask him to um, share his uh, words and insight, I just want to remind the community why we are doing these sessions. Um, 
uh, you, as we know, um, current events don't come with a disclaimer, and yet um, this year has been quite an event, a year of um, reflection of what's happening in our country, both from a health perspective um, with the backdrop of the coronavirus, and then um, incidents like George Floyd's murder, and the long overdue national outrage, which has amplified the racial injustices of our country, and um, really brought the conversation forward about systemic racism. Um, for us, as, a, as our religion of Islam teaches us, um, equality of mankind and standing for justice is a, is a core component of our religion. But without education, insight, and empathy, um, achieving progress is um, very, very difficult. And that's why we started these conversations. We had one, uh, couple weeks back and now um, we'd just like to continue this conversation and um, I hope that the audience was able to um, watch the movie, listen to the words and um, near the end we really want to hear your reflection. So um, with that I will ask Mr. Lampley to start. Good afternoon everyone. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Uh, yes? Okay. Well, well first off I want to confess that I don't believe I belong on the same stage, on the same screen, uh, or mention in the same breath as Brian Stevenson. Um, he is a hero of mine, and and he is far more accomplished and far more committed to these areas uh, than I could ever hope to be. Um, but I'm but I'm honored to be invited to speak today. You know, when I, when I think about racism in America and racism generally and how it is really just a very powerful system that creates false hierarchies of human value. And the movie Just Mercy, I know we're going to talk about it. Um, and I have like constellations of reflections about it. But I, I do want to just keep it brief so that we can engage in a dialogue, perhaps. But the movie shows how, how powerful racism can be it's especially evil and wicked when it's wielded by people in positions of power and authority. I'd like to think that the movie depicted an extreme example of how the system can identify and target an innocent black man for no reason at all other than to mollify a community community of racists who hold certain beliefs about black men generally. And I think that's what the movie is really about. That's the theme is the unfairness of the justice system, the very structure that is put in place to ensure that we're supposed to have some justice, it is used as an instrument of abuse. And you see it over and over again. Um, at the end of this talk, I'm not sure how many of you um, have studied Mr. Stevenson in any great detail. But in 2017, he gave a speech at the American College of Trial Lawyers. Um, it's, it's probably, it's called the American Tr College of Trial Lawyers, but it is a global um, organization that recognizes uh, lawyers uh, who have demonstrated excellence in oral advocacy. And he gave a speech, I believe it was in March of 2017. I'm, I'm sure I have it somewhere and I can include 
a link to that speech at the end of this um, if I need to. But he is so thoughtful and insightful and provocative. Um, he just he leaves you with an impression that we need more people like him. When I, when I think about racism, everybody on this call understands that it doesn't only affect black people. It takes so many different forms. I like to refer to it as an invidious hydra with a bunch of different evil tentacles that strikes out and seeks to oppress people based upon their nationality, their culture, their religion, their gender, their sexual orientation, their nationality, their class, you name it. There's, a, there's an evil tentacle that racism and bigotry and oppression um, will wield against anybody that can be deemed a target because that person is different. When I think about relating the movie and racism generally to current events, there is no argument really that can be made that the person who was elected president in 2016 created the racist system that tends to oppress people of color. He didn't create it. All he did was gin it up, inflame people, use it to divide us, and unfortunately had some success. He exposed an evil illness that has been bubbling at the surface in America for centuries. My sense is that though, is that because we elected a black president in 2008, too many Americans thought that we had checked that box and we could move on to the next issue. And I think the 2016 election exposed the fallacy of that way of thinking. He didn't just stop there though. He didn't stop with his campaign. He continues to espouse those racist views that really cut out the heart of who we are supposed to be as a nation. When you think about the words on the Statue of, Lim of Liberty, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free. E pluribus unum. He doesn't want that. And it is as obvious today as it was when he was first elected. When you think about an approval rating of 40% or more of Americans, and America is more than 300 million people, it just it hurts my heart and it boggles my mind to think that more than 120 million Americans are ultimately okay with what this guy has been doing and continues to do. When you think about referring to people of Latin descent as rapists, and murderers. When you think about just within the past couple of years, suggesting that Representative Tlaib and, and Omar should go back to their own countries, these are American citizens. And the quote was, she is trying to tell us how to run our country. This is an American citizen that he's talking about. But it's red meat for the base. And just last week, 
in Tulsa. I don't know if it was true, but I read an article that one of the best selling peaches, pieces of merchandise outside of that rally was anti-Obama paraphernalia. A person who has not run for president since 2012 and hasn't been president since late 2016, early 2017. It is that gear that is being sold at these rallies. And it's nothing more than throwing red meat at the base to further divide us as a nation because it is an easy mark to criticize a black man with a funny name who brought us change that so many Americans were not ready for. And this is something that plagues us all. And I was introduced to it a long time ago. And I had an epiphany of sorts when I graduated from law school. Shortly after I graduated, I accepted a job at a large law firm. My dad was a cook in a hospital kitchen had never made more than maybe nine or $10 an hour. So I had a big job at a big firm in Cincinnati. I had a nice suit, nice shoes, nice shirt and tie. And I was walking down the street. I think I was 25 years old um, in 1988. And I was earning $50,000, which is more money than I'd ever seen in my life. And so I was walking down the street and there was a Payless shoe store that I passed by. And I saw a young white woman who was carrying a child who could not have been a year old. It was an infant, maybe six or seven months old. She had another child who was a little girl. And that girl was probably three years old. It was in October or November. It was a little chilly outside. The little girl didn't have on any shoes. And I noticed that her feet were bleeding. So if ever I thought there was a sign from our creator that now I'm in a position to do something about this situation that I'm witnessing, I had to do it. So I approached the young lady who was maybe 22, 23 years old. And I said to her, excuse me, ma'am, would you, we were, we were sitting right in front of a Payless shoe store. And you can get 10 pairs of shoes at Payless for $10. I said, excuse me, ma'am, would you allow me to buy your beautiful daughter a pair of shoes? I noticed that she's not wearing shoes. She recoiled, she backed off of me, and she said, and I'm going to be graphic because this is the way it cut me and I apologize if I offend anybody. She said, get the F away from me. I don't need no damn help from no damn nigger. That's what she said to me. I was wearing a tie. I was wearing a suit and what she saw, what she was introduced to was the color of my skin and whatever happened to her in her life, she wasn't able to see past that to perhaps get some help for her daughter. That was a very rude awakening for me. And it told me that it doesn't matter what your status is. In the eyes of some people, you will never escape their impression of what blackness means. And their impression of what blackness means is not a good thing in any stretch. I can fast forward 30 plus years. This just happened to me six months ago, what I'm about to tell you. 
I was asked to join a litigation team in a case that was going south. And I was asked to deliver the closing argument. The case had been pending for about eight years. It was an eight week trial. I had nothing to do with the case, but I had to learn it in about three days in order to deliver what I hoped to be an effective closing argument. So I stayed up all night, two or three nights in a row. The client came in for a mock argument. So we were sitting around conference room, large conference room, probably 20 people. And I delivered the closing argument about an hour and a half. Didn't use notes, had exhibits, had a little PowerPoint. And um, I thought it went pretty well. I had no comments. And the president of the company said, why don't you run through that again? And I said, you know what, Mr. Blank? I have been up all night, three nights in a row. And if I try to do this again, it's not going to be anywhere as effective because my adrenaline is now gone and I want to save it for the real thing tomorrow. His response, I thought you black guys didn't get tired. He said that in a room of 20 people. And as opposed to challenging him on that, I said, this black guy is tired and I'm going home to rest. And I'll see you tomorrow if you want me to make this argument. And I left the room. One of the reasons why I didn't delve deeply into it is because as a lawyer, you're not supposed to allow your personal beliefs to affect your advocacy on behalf of a client. I wish that weren't the case because I would have loved to have had a conversation with him, one that I haven't had with him. And we won the case and he got to keep his company and he didn't have to pay $80 million. So as I think about the events of the past month or so and being the father of two young African-American males, ages 22 and 24. We have had the talk multiple times. There was a book that was authored by one of my friends. His name is Eric Broyles, and it's called Encounters with Police, A Black Man's Guide to Survival. And the premise of the book is we wanna get you home safely. So both of my sons know if they are stopped by the police, the word of the day is cooperation. Your hands are at 10 o'clock and two o'clock on the steering wheel. It's yes, sir. It's no, sir. And what Mr. Broyles says in the book is comply now, contest later. The time to challenge a police officer is not when he is standing outside of your window with his hand on his gun. You're gonna lose that battle every time. And if, as it turns out, he did not have just cause to stop you, you take down the information and you challenge it later. Comply now, contest later. And all too often, with police situations being what they are and the police brutality and the unions, and we can talk about all of that. All too often, my son drives a 2012 Honda Accord. It is entirely possible that there was a police run, a police blotter that said, that suggested African-American male driving late model Honda seen in area just committed assault armed and dangerous. And maybe that's the thing that's in this officer's mind. So that what you have to be able to do, I've told my sons 
countless times, and it's happened to me before. I have been profiled while driving in, in Indian Hill. Um, what you have to do is diffuse the situation. It's up to you, I've told them, to make the officer comfortable so that he doesn't kill you. And I've been that blunt about it. I don't know how long I've been going, but I suspect that it's been more than 15 minutes. And I do want to comply with what I've been asked to do. So I'll turn it back over to whomever is to succeed me, but I'll remain available to ask to answer questions and engage in dialogue. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we haven't even got to the, to, to the half of it, I feel like. Um, but um, it's profound um, how you point out that there is no privilege that can, ex you know, keep you from experiencing racism. And um, I think sometimes that's something that's forgotten. Um, you know, it doesn't matter what degrees you have, it's still the color of your skin that somehow becomes paramount in people's minds. And I honestly don't know how we will ever get beyond that, but that is the attempt here. So um, the, the movie Just Mercy is by Brian Stevenson. And um, the more I read about him, the more I'm just um, impressed by his commitment. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I don't know what makes a person to take that on. I mean, you know, a Harvard grad going into the deep south and doing what he's been doing for decades now. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce Shaquille Ahmad. She is our um, board chair emeritus, a leader who um, in our community who has just been an incredible role model for uh, engagement, interfaith relations, and standing for social justice. So with that, I'd like to turn the uh, forum over to her. Okay. Thank you for uh, unmuting me. <laughs> it's a two-step process, but um, you know, it, uh, it is both humbling and honor and extremely important for us to be here for this conversation. One of many, as uh, we, we hope going into the future, I want to thank Nathaniel for really sharing your personal story with us because I think it underscores the um, both the reasons for these conversations that we must have. And it also underscores um, the work of Brian Stevenson. And, uh, you know, we by no way, um, you know, uh, are doing any comparison because you offer, I think, inside experience and a wealth of information that our community and our region and beyond can learn so much from your personal experiences, the education that you've had to give your boys. And that is an education that, you know, I've been involved in social justice work for two decades, but, you know, this education of how to survive a police encounter is something that I've heard repeated more than a dozen times through the mouths of parents in our own community. And it, breaks my heart because in many ways, you know, we as Muslim Americans were so blind to some of the injustices that our African American brothers and sisters have been going through for 400 years, but particularly the last, you know, um, so many decades where we thought that we had civil rights, we had you know, um, freedom to live our lives as, uh, as all Americans being equal. And, and in reality, the systemic racism, which is the underpinning for the work of Brian Stevenson that he continues to do today, that he started 30 years ago, um, is the reason that we absolutely have to have these conversations and you are having to deal with the experiences that even six months ago, which, you know, seems appalling to us as someone of your caliber coming in to do an incredibly, you know, professional job for corporate America are um, spoken to in that way. And, you know, 
you have to walk away and do your job because that's what a professional is demanded to do. And so I wanted to put that as uh, the foundation for some of the people that are listening, because I think it's really those personal experiences that we're missing. Even when we watch an incredibly powerful movie like Just Mercy, even when I had the opportunity to meet Brian Stevenson a few years back when I was on the executive board of the YWCA Cincinnati and chaired the racial justice uh, committee and work. And he was our keynote speaker for the racial justice breakfast, which included many lawyers like yourselves. But as you know, you are a minority among minorities. When I walk into a room of Cincinnati top lawyers, I can maybe see two or three African Americans in the room. And so, you know, um, for someone of Brian's caliber uh, to come in and speak to the group about systemic racism and particularly about the inequalities in our justice system was one of the most powerful experiences that I've had. And it was powerful because not only about, um, you know, he going to Alabama 30 years ago and starting um, uh, you know, with his uh, office partner, Ava, who's also portrayed in the film, um, with his Harvard degree, this, uh, you know, equal justice, um, oh, uh, pardon my, uh, the equal justice of initi initiative in uh, Alabama, it was really, you know, the fact that he's having to continue to do that work today. So even though Walter D. McMillan conveyed in the movie um, was purely because of racial evil malice, as you put it, um, was basically put on death row before he even had a trial. And so uh, completely, you know, um, in no way associated with the crime and it took so long and someone of such caliber as Brian Stevenson and this Equal Justice Initiative to barely get him free. I mean, he was um, denied that freedom, even though it was clear that he was not the killer. So, you know, when we as an audience, when we as people in our communities today look at racism, we have to understand is the systemic nature of that racism. And then we also have to understand and realize how it is perpetuated today in its many forms, whether it's through the justice system, whether it's through the, you know, um, police who, was, who are there to serve and protect us, or whether it's through corporate America. And so if we don't recognize those issues and that, racism that permeates through all aspects of our society, then we are never going to be able to get beyond it. And so I, you know, I really want to have us, as we begin to talk about, the movie was incredibly powerful. We watched it as a family. Um, even though I had heard him speak, he has a memoir um, by the same name that I would encourage everyone to, to seek out and uh, get. There's a documentary. Um, online uh, about his work in addition to the talk that we're going to uh, give a link to. There's a TED talk available that we would also like to recommend for people uh, to really get a deeper, under, deeper understanding about both the incredible story of Brian Stevenson, but more importantly, the work that needs to be done and is being done. And there are other initiatives um, you know, like the Ohio Innocence Project and other work that has uh, begun subsequently that really tries to wrong, um, you know, right the wrongs that have been perpetuated at the hand of our justice system. And so uh, I think this is one of the many reasons we want to have this conversation. And the other is, is that we really want to begin to have a conversation with the people in our community and beyond as to what is it the role that we have to play, you know? So Brian Stevenson had a Southern woman 
uh, Ava Ansley, I believe is, was, is her real name. And she's still the, you know, the business director for that. What role is it that we play? Even if we're not people of black color, we may be brown, we may be white, we may be of Asian heritage. What role do we have to play in not just fighting racism, but promoting anti-racism. What is it that we are doing on a daily basis and on a systemic basis? Because this is not a one protest um, deal. This is not something that's, you know, I can go to Mason, be a part of 3,000 people in a walk and feel like I've done my job. No, that, that, is, that is only the very tip of the iceberg and that's to raise awareness. Once you raise awareness, then the work must begin. And so what kind of a partner are we going to be in the work in order to promote anti-racism in our community? And how is it that we are going to enable our systems, our societies to treat people as equal Americans? And how is it that we're going to be advocates for people who do not or are not allowed the opportunity to have their voice heard? So these are, you know, I think, some of the lessons that I took away from um, both Brian Stevenson as the individual and as um, Just Mercy as the movie. And so, um, you know, as we progress, Amina, through the discussion, um, I would like to engage Nathaniel in some of those questions that, um, you know, that we have to pose to ourselves as to how we can be effective in addressing those. And so it, it cannot be done without consultation and collaboration with people who are experiencing it directly. And it cannot be done without our enge engagement in the civic society in which we live, whether it be nonprofit boards such as the YWCA that does uh, empowering women and eliminating racism as their mission or the NAACP or the Urban League or the United Way or, uh, you know, um, even our chamber in Westchester is spearheading conversations between the community and our police force. So it has to be done on so many different levels. And so every one of the people that are on this call and everyone connected to them must really begin to assess how it is that they are going to engage in not just the conversation, but what's really important that follows the work in order to help us realize the dream of, you know, uh, an anti-racist society. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Samina, and then we can, you know, engage with um, additional conversation. Okay. So I just want to thank um, you because, um, uh, you've done so much and uh, for our community, I think it's a really important reminder that um, we need to remind ourselves, this is not just a problem or an issue of the African American community. This is a problem that is uh, prevalent in all society and it's not something we should just um, you know, think, oh, it's not our problem. If we could just internalize that and realize not only does our religion call us to this, but also humanity calls us to this. Getting back to that, this is um, a picture of the author, Brian Stevenson. And in addition to the movie, there's the book. I have not read the book, but I'm, I'm thinking it would have even more valuable insight into mm -hmm. it. Um, as I asked the community to start gathering their thoughts, I wanted to just share some of the uh, powerful quotes that I feel like um, really um, are, are moments of reflection for us. Um, they're on the screen here. I don't necessarily need to read them all out to you, um, but just take a minute, you know. Um, I'll, I'll at least read the first one. The true measure of our character is how we treat the poor, the disfavored, the accused, the incarcerated, and the condemned. And in the movie, um, you know, it's, it's, it's just so eloquently said and stated. And I really hope that um, our community has watched the movie and um, internalized some of this. Um, here's just a picture, um, as Shakila mentioned, he does have a TED talk, if you wanna go and hear about that, um, and some more quotes. Um, and here's just some background of the Equal Justice Initiative that he founded, um, and they do talk about that in the movie. 
committed to ending mass incarceration, excessive punishment in the United States. But that's not all they do. Um, you know, if you browse on their website, they um, challenge racial and economic injustice and to protect basic human rights for the most vulnerable people in American society. It's a great website. I'd encourage you to go um, take a look at it. Um, and with that, um, I would like to open it up to um, the community. Um, I have, you know, you can just send me a message and I will um, unmute you, uh, share your video if you'd like. But we really want to hear um, from the community, what did you, um, what was the most powerful message that you got from this movie? And also, um, what would you do differently after seeing this? Um, so right now, nobody has um, uh, said anything. Thanks, Mina. While, uh, while we're waiting for people to um, raise their hand, they can, I guess they can either raise their hand in the chat box or they can send you a message, right? Yes. And they can send it to everyone or they can send it directly to you and then you will unmute them. Yes. And, uh, you know, engage them in this work. Uh, while we're waiting for that, um, I would like to ask Nathaniel because, you know, he is uh, obviously a very prominent lawyer and he understands the justice judicial system specifically uh, very well. So, you know, from your point of view, Nathaniel, what are some things that people, um, everyday citizens can do in regards to uh, seeing that we have more justice in our judicial system? Because you know, blacks not only get arrested more often, they're, um, you know, uh, they're, what's the word, uh, not acquitted, the opposite of found guilty more often. Their sentences are much worse than they are for equal uh, counterparts that are Caucasian. So what is it that we can do in order to try to see um, that there's more equity in our judicial system? Um, again, uh, just, just listening to you, uh, Samina and Shaquilla, it just, it triggers so many thoughts that I have. Um, I heard Samina say that this is our problem and it doesn't only affect one community. It reminds me of the words of Dr. King when he said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And that sort of relates, what can we do? Mm -hmm. It relates to another quote that, that is up there in my head from, from Edmund Burke when he said, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph over good is for good people to do nothing. So yes, there is something that you can do. And one place to start, actually, is the speech from Brian Stevenson. Um, at the end of the speech, and I'll send you the link, he gives four things that people can do in order, so, in order to help us move towards racial equality. It is, it is a 900-pound gorilla that we have to eat one bite at a time and change is not going to come quickly and it's not going to come easily. But the first thing he said that we can all do is to get close to affected people. Do whatever you can do to get close to people who are living in the margins, those people who have literally been marginalized by the system. That's the first thing. The second thing is to change the narrative. When you think about changing the narrative, in, 19, in, in 2015, there was a poll taken about whether or not there was an issue with police brutality against African-Americans. And I believe 25% of Americans said Yes, 75% said no. Something around in 2020, in June of 2020, it's been flipped. 75% of Americans. So it appears as though there has been somewhat of a global 
epiphany. So when you can actually change the narrative mm -hmm. and persuade people that there is a problem, then you can start on fixing it. And I'm, I'm thinking about James Baldwin now. Mm -hmm. Baldwin said, you can't change everything simply by facing it but you can't change anything if you don't face it. So you have to change the narrative. The third thing that, that Stevenson said was to remain hopeful. You can never give up. You can be afflicted, but never defeated. So the third thing is to remain hopeful. And the fourth thing is to be prepared to be uncomfortable and inconvenienced. None of these conversations are e easy. And when I, when I think about those four things, get close to, eff to effective people, change the narrative, remain hopeful, and be prepared for uncomfortable situations, we can all do that. Powerful. You know, and I wanna, and, and I, I'm sure, Samina, you wanna, uh, uh, take from here but I, I wanted to just because I'm reminded when you speak to those four things I'm really reminded because most of the audiences uh, from the Muslim community it, it seems like is I want to remind it I can take each one of those things and I can tie it back to things in my faith tradition in terms of you know getting close to people that are affected um, you know being able to tell your story, being a voice for um, really allowing people to understand what you just showed us is the flipping of people's view of injustice. And, um, you know, and, and that sometimes we have to go through hardship in order to get to a better place. And, you know, God tells us that he does not put a burden upon us more than what we can bear. And right. boy, it sure seems heavy right now it sure seems heavy right now but this is our opportunity to rise up to what we're made of and what people are capable of doing so um uh, you know and 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 i know you're a person of faith and you know we can never lose hope so thank you that that was absolutely beautiful and i i can't way to uh, listen to all of his talk. So to follow up on that, um, our board chair um, actually has brought up a question related to this. Because um, I think of the four things that you said, um, how do you not lose hope? Um, that's just so, like, you know, when you watch that movie, that was at one point when you're waiting to hear the, um, the, the second judge give his, um, give her opinion, like you just your heart has stopped because you just yeah. that hope how do you not lose that hope and with that I'd, um dr amir is who is our board chair um is um has a question just kind of related to that so i think i unmuted the right person hopefully hey good afternoon mr lemby this is uh, this is amir amir is and thank you very much for doing what you're doing uh, it is very uh, beautiful for this community to listen to all that what you just said and for the kind of work that you do I just want to uh, hear your opinion on as, as Samina as Samina said that when you do the work that you do and after doing this work for such a long time then then how do you find the energy to do all that number one and number two when you see the incidents like George Floyd incident how, how discouraging it is and how you keep yourself motivated to keep the, the work that you're doing if we can comment a comment on that Thank you, thank you, sir. Um, I'll, I'll just I'll just tell you a little bit about me. When I was, I am the sixth of seven children. I had five older sisters and one younger brother. When I was five years old, my then six-year-old sister was struck by a car and killed instantly. That was in 1968. My mother was, host, uh, was institutionalized at Longview State Hospital, which is where Drake is now, um, for almost six years. And I, I can't even fathom that. And, and when she was released, she was never the same. And she had a nervous breakdown. 
and she died at age 37. And so my dad, again, who had six children now to care for, and he was a cook in a kitchen, he was making five bucks an hour. And, you know, he gave us everything we needed and some of what we wanted. And when I, when I think about my childhood and how on the outside things appeared to be difficult, but we always had our faith. And we all know that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. I mean, where would we be without our faith? I think that was the topic of my Vesper speech. Where would we be without our faith? Giving up faith for me, sir, has simply never been an option. It's just not. And I have to tell you, when I, when I think about George Floyd and the immediate reaction and the significant reaction and the global reaction from every corner of the universe except Pennsylvania Avenue. When I, when I think about that, and I've said this to people before, and, and maybe I'm exaggerating, George Floyd certainly was not the first black man to be murdered mm -hmm. by the police. He wasn't the first. Mm -hmm. Rosa Parks was not the first black woman or black person to be arrested and jailed for failing to give up her seat on a bus in Montgomery. But there was a movement that started because of Rosa Parks. And my sense is this feels different. When I see people in Amsterdam and in Rome and in Luxembourg and in London, and they're all holding up pictures of George Floyd from Minneapolis, this tells me that we are on the cusp of transformational change. And shame on us if we don't take advantage of this moment when history is begging us to do something that will be, that we can be proud of for generations. I think that people will begin to, 50 years from now, people will think of George Floyd, not unlike we now think of Rosa Parks. That's my hope, that's my prayer, and that's what I have faith in. It's up to us now to do something about it. And shame on us if we don't. That reminds me a lot of times when we, you know, read the history books and we read about Nazi Germany or um, other injustices. Um, and we ask ourselves, would, where would we have been? Would we have um, been the, the quiet ones or would we have raised a voice or would we have um, mm -hmm. uh, been of those who actually followed the oppression? And I think, um, like I said before, current events don't come with a disclaimer, but these are the times of change. Um, and um, I really hope everybody, at least in this conversation in our community chooses to be on the side of justice. So I, uh, few, many more questions are coming in. I am going to, um, un, along the same lines, unmute um, Aziz, and he has a question. Uh, Nathaniel, thank you very much for your time and your uh, powerful experiences for sharing. Really appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to be a little blunt on this because I think there's a very specific issue we have to address, and that is... One of the challenges is that in America right now, we have very specific media bubbles that people live in. A large segment of this country specifically is in the right wing media bubble that amplifies voices of bigotry, racism, Islamophobia, everything else. And they create their own facts, they create their own narratives for their viewership. And so it's hard for us to engage in dialogue, even agreeing on basic factual information with these people. So how do we 
I mean, any strategies or any thoughts on how do we engage in basic conversations or these difficult conversations when people won't even agree to basic facts about the way the events are unfolding? You know, uh, thank you, Aziz. Uh, I think that's an insightful observation. and It is a real problem. And I, I can never remember a time in history where I could not sit down and have a, a thoughtful conversation with someone who holds a different political view than I do. It's, it's almost as if I agree with you. You can't even talk about it. When has that been the case? And it raises the issue about how we go about, you know, what can we do to change the hearts and the souls of people? Because that's what we're talking about. The media has an agenda setting function and, and you're right, there are both, you have both sides of the issue. You have the right side and the wrong side. I mean, that's the way I see it. And it's amazing mm -hmm. to me how two different media companies can take the same set of facts and portray them in su such, such a varied way. I mean, the idea that we would politicize the wearing of a protective facial covering is to me mind boggling. And you're just gonna allow a guy to lead you over a cliff. So that is a long way of saying, sir, that I believe that this change is going to have to come very slowly. I don't see us ever um, infringing upon anyone's First Amendment rights. Uh, only, I mean, the only exception that I can think of, and Mark Zuckerberg has finally learned his lesson after, mm -hmm. after he lost $7 billion because he was allowing anybody to say anything on his platform mm -hmm. after having criticized Twitter for doing the same thing. He is now doing the same thing. So the First Amendment, you know, speech, religious liberty, I mean, we have to have that. And, and there's no Absolutely. shutting that down. Absolutely. And I think that we're going to have to inch closer to, to equality with the transformational changes that we're talking about with programs, with police reform, with you know, just, just things that you can do today on a daily basis. And, and I think we have to, you know, just take it one step at a time because Fox News is not going away. They're not. Right. And we have to accept that. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Christina Hudak, and I'm going to ask her to um, unmute herself so she can go. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, okay. I can hear you. Okay. So I had a two-part question. What is your advice for white people wanting to get close, as was mentioned, and have an impact, but not be seen as the, quote, white savior? How do you best suggest one walk that line so that the interactions and assistance are seen as genuine and not patronizing? And my second part to that was, how does a white person help advocate in a public space without being seen as speaking for or taking the mic from people of color? Um, thank you, Ms. Hudak. Uh, first of all, I think you have to be who you are. And I think you can't be worried about perception. And I think if you, if you are doing something for the right reason, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. Um, and, I, and I think I talked about this in my in my Vesper talk, the real change from the civil rights movement didn't take place until people from different communities, from different faiths, from different races, from different states. When you think about the protests in, in Mississippi, Cal Berkeley, and places like that, it wasn't just black people. So I think you have to be who you are, be true to yourself, and if your heart is telling you to get close to people, just do it and, and be steadfast in it. And if somebody questions your motives, they're just wrong. And it's going to be uncomfortable, as Brian Stevenson tells us. So simply because somebody is suggesting that you want to take the mic or you want to, you, you want to, you, you're not being genuine or you're just a white face, I would just tune out that noise and go about doing the work that's necessary to bring this change. I think you have to ignore the naysayers. If you are committed in your heart, then none of that stuff ought to matter. And I don't mean that in the pejorative sense. I'm not suggesting that you're being overly sensitive. What I am saying is, no matter what you do in this area, 
you're going to have a bunch of people who disagree with what you were doing. Right. And that's where the challenge comes in. And you just got to be steadfast and in it for the long run because there are no simple, short, easy answers. Thank you. And I, maybe I would just like to add to that. Sometimes we may not do it the right way. And sometimes we may be insensitive. And sometimes, um, you know, we may, like I said, not do it the right way. But um, I don't think that gives us an excuse to stop trying. So um, there was one comment that I received. Um, uh, I want people to avoid falling into the right wing, left wing trap. Systemic racism was constructed and maintained by peace in all political party parties and characterizing it as a right wing, left wing issue just misses the systemic nature of the problem. So what would you say to that? I don't, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I'm not, I am not into labels, but there is no question what Fox News stands for. And generally speaking, what CNN and CNBC and, and, and MSNBC stand for. I mean, those are, those are very different ends of the political spectrum and they do exist, even if we don't label them. And I do agree that the problem is systemic mm -hmm. and there's a lot of work to do on both sides and labels don't help. Um, so when I was mentioning that, I was responding to a particular question on the, about the news media. Okay, then here's a question. Um, what are your thoughts on defunding the police movement and how can faith-based organizations or even ordinary individuals help support in this regard? And also thank you for sharing your journey with us. You know, thank you, you're welcome. Um, I, I think whoever started that movement perhaps should have titled it differently. Yeah. <laughs> because the police are always going to be important. Right. There will always be some level of police policing needed because there are certain people who the police need to deal with. And frankly, I don't want to deal with them. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I would say, as opposed to defund, what about reform? I think that the, 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 mm -hmm. the best example that I've heard of happened in Camden, New Jersey, where they, they, they completely shut down the police department. I shouldn't say shut it down. They, they reformed it. They disbanded it, and then they hired a bunch of people back. When you think about a 22-year-old recent graduate of the police academy who was given a whistle, a gun, and a pair of handcuffs, and you want this person to go into a housing project where there's mental illness and domestic abuse, and you want him to solve that problem or to assist to solve that problem, all he knows is that he is the authority and you better damn well do what I say because I'm a cop and I'm 22 years old, I got a gun. That's the kind of reform I'm talking about. I think it involves mental health professionals. I think it involves counselors. I think it involves just a whole committee of people who can deal with the problems in society as opposed to sending out a cop to deal with every situation. So as opposed to defund the police, I would say reform the police. You don't want to defund that. That's kind of silly. And it's easy, it's easy to, to poke holes in that because the idea is to be ludicrous. Yeah, because when you hear defund the police, then you're like, well, and who are you gonna call if you know you need the police? So I agree. Um, name matters. I think Shakila had something she wanted to share. So Sure. Um, you know, I, I think that the questions are great. So keep them coming uh, for this really important uh, conversation. Uh, just to Aziz, and I think Kristen, Christina raised a couple of points and Nathaniel went right to the heart of it. But one thing I want to share just from my personal perspective, when it becomes, seems to be overwhelming when you hear negative um, narratives over you know mass media or the voices you know the i mean we know squeaky wheel gets the grease and you know so those crazy crazy ladies in west palm beach are all over the internet because they're saying outrageous ridiculous things but yet they have the platform now because they're saying outrageous ridiculous things so one thing that i um i've been engaged in um it's a Harvard-based course by uh, Dr. Marshall Gantz, who's really 
a civil rights advocate and uh, you know does this whole series called uh, navigating disruptive change and public narrative and so when we're talking about you know just having these loud voices out there one thing that we can think about a number of things that I've been really kind of reshaping my thinking about is yes you know telling your own narrative and allowing people to see that narrative will allow those kind of systemic changes in uh, perceptions of people that Nathaniel talked to uh, in regards to whether it's systemic racism or pre brutality but the key thing about telling narratives you know my voice is one voice so but if i align align my voice my needs and power with other needs and power so whether it be across faith communities whether it be across races whether it be across socially economic you know classes but we have the same needs and we all have a power we have a power in our voice so how do we leverage that in collaboration with others and then the key things is that i you know it, it's such an obvious is that to harness the power of your narrative tell tell your personal story the way that nathaniel did tell your personal story and tell it with emotion and allow and allow yourself to be a little bit vulnerable in order for people to understand what is it that others are experiencing that they would never never be able to experience it. So I, as a Muslim American, can align my narrative with, you know, my African American brothers and sisters, because in many ways we experience so many things. We may see it in a different way and may share it in a different way, but my God, our needs and our voices of power are things that can be aligned. So, you know, tell your stories, align it with others, use you know images instead of emotions in order to get your story across and people will be compelled to listen thank you um so uh since there's no questions right now i'll i'll share a little personal narrative of mine um, i grew up in orlando florida where the sun shines very brightly we had no pools, so we would run outside in the sprinklers um, pretty much all day to entertain ourselves. And I remember when I was about eight years old, I was in um, Pakistan, the country of my parents, and I was just, it was a hot summer day and I was just walking around and um, one of my aunts made a comment, a very fun loving kind aunt, but this is the comment she made and I'll say it in Urdu first and then I'll translate it. And what she said was, um, and what that means is this girl is so dark what's going to happen to her right and um to these to this day um that comment um sticks in my head like am i too dark do i have to um, prove myself with a b c and d so it just kind of reminds me that um this, you know, I read a quote one time and I'll read it out to you, but it really uh, comes to the heart of the matter. And I actually shared this quote when I um, went to the uh, Vesper and basically it says, watch your thoughts for they become words because, you know, that was the thought, a dark girl, a dark Daisy girl, not going to make much of her life. Watch your words because they become actions. And yes, you know, in our Daisy community, um, you know, those do become the actions um, of who gets married first. Um, watch your actions for they become habits. Watch your habits for they become character. And watch your character for, be for it becomes your destiny. And I guess it just reminds us, I mean, the color of our skin is really just skin deep. And yet, over the course of history, look at the impact it has had and how do you move beyond that? But I was just sharing my personal narrative, so. <laughs> Full of images and very powerful. So with that, um, Tariq Harani um, raised his hand and somehow I missed that. So send me a message if you're raising hands and I'm missing that and I will um, un unmute him so he can talk. Tariq? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, thank, thank you. you. 
uh, my question to Mr. Lampley, and uh, first, thank you for sharing your thoughts and your story with us. I am encouraged to see the recent response and reaction and the movement in general. I'm not only talking about uh, BLM, but the movement in general to the, uh, to the recent event. Even though the murder of George Floyd is not the first by any stretch of imagination, or the last, unfortunately, but somehow the movement, the popular culture, the media has picked up on that. And we are in a relatively good place, so to speak. And I am uh, reminded by a quote by Brian Stevens toward the end of the movie where he spoke about, about hope. And I think Mr. Lampley, you alluded to that earlier. So, uh, so that is a good thing. Now, my question is, is how do, you, how do we maintain, how do we capitalize on the energy level, if you will, on the place that we are at, so this won't turn in into, you know, like another murder or another story and it will be gone. So how do we take advantage of that? How do we turn this into a historic or rather a history changing event? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we just have to keep doing what we're talking about. Um, if you're not already doing those four things that Mr. Stevenson um, talked about, do it. Um, get close to affected people, change the narrative, remain hopeful, and be prepared to be uncomfortable. When I'm talking about changing the narrative, I'm talking about challenging people on whatever preconceived notions they might, might have of people who might be different than they are. And um, again, I think that all of the survey, I mean, who, who believes surveys now that we, you know, after 2016, I'm not sure I'll ever believe in those <laughs> surveys. But um, after the, I mean, you watch, I mean, just, just think about a cop can kneel on a black man's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And he sees that someone is videotaping him with a phone and he doesn't stop. The other day I went into Kroger and I parked my car and I got out and I timed myself. I parked my car, I got out of the car, I went in, into the store, I got milk, eggs, and I think I grabbed some ground turkey or something. And I went through the self-checkout lane. And it took me six minutes and 32 seconds. So I went grocery shopping. And if, I, if he had been kneeling on someone's neck in that parking lot, he still would have been kneeling after I returned. I mean, when you, when you think about the graphic nature of that, mm -hmm. and maybe that's what had to happen. I'm so sorry this man had to lose his life. But we needed to wake the heck up. And we have to feel this. And that, that video should continue to be shown to remind people that this is a real problem. So I say to you, continue to do what you are doing. It takes all of us. None of us can give up. Absolutely. And um, that just reminds me, um, I read somewhere like so many uh, of the Black Lives Matter people have died, but have we really had a moment of mourning? I mean, you know, people, so many people are dying and how many of us are even aware of it at, for no reason? And I think George Floyd was a wake up call. Mm -hmm. um, but why did it take this long? I don't know. It was, it was easy to dismiss it. People aren't ready to have the tough conversations. No one was willing to step out there and, and change the narrative. And, and I'll, I'll, I will confess this. Um, when, when the young man, DeBose, was killed by the... University of Cincinnati, Sam DuBose. Samuel DeBose. Um, I represented the University of Cincinnati in the civil case. I mean, the prosecutor obviously brings charges. 
And, and I was determined to do justice, even though I represented the defendant. Um, and I, I probably shouldn't say any more than that, and I hope that doesn't go any further. But lawyers are supposed to do justice. And, and there was a, a significant seven-figure se settlement that was, that was paid to the estate. And when some people in the black community heard that I was representing UC in the case against Mr. DeBose's estate, you should have seen the emails I was getting. Uncle Tom, traitor, house Negro, those kinds of things. When all I was trying to do was to do justice. Now, justice is rough when you're talking about money. Um, and again, I probably shouldn't say more about how I feel about the case. Um, but we do have to stand up. And I, I'm glad we are at this moment. I'm sorry that someone had to lose their life in such a violent way for us to get here. And we can't let it pass. So that was actually a comment that was shared. So you think that the fact that the officer so blatantly murdered Mr. Floyd is what has made the difference, that this is what it took to get more white Americans to stand up with our brothers and sisters, that this murder just couldn't be hidden? Yeah, but you know, we're still not there because one of the biggest problems is police unions. I mean, we deal with this year in and year out. You could have a policeman be charged 10 times with police brutality and get suspended. And then on the 11th time, mm -hmm. the arbitrator reinstates him with full back, play, back pay. All he has to do is say, I fear for my life. It doesn't have to be objectively reasonable. And there's this qualified immunity that also attaches to police conduct. And we're trying to modify that and, and use more of a common sense approach. So even though many Americans had an epiphany, a huge problem is police unions. And I'll say that to anybody. It's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I mean, I, this conversation could go on forever, uh, but we are nearing the end of our time. I just wanted to um, share um, just a few um, screens that we had, just organizations in the region and beyond that are doing, in addition to the Equal Justice Initiative, sometimes, you know, we won't protest, we won't go in the marches, we don't write, we don't speak, but maybe just our money, give to, give to these organizations that are doing the work for us, support them with our presence and our resources. Um, and I've shared this before and I'll share it again um, as needed. And then, you know, the only way you can have insight into anything is education. And these are just some books and documentaries that we shared at our last session. And we can make these available again. And if Mr. Lampley has anything to add to this, please, by all means. Um, but um, don't let this conversation die when it's not popular anymore is probably another big take home message because um, this needs to continue. Um, 400 years, 500 years of this is far too long. Um, and who says we can't be the generation that brought about change? Um, yeah. So, absolutely. And then I will uh, say, I will say that a, a great place to start on on your list uh -huh. is 13th. If it's the Ava DuVernay mm -hmm. documentary, I would start there, okay. and then and then follow up. There, there's another one that is on. I'm a, I'm a huge James Baldwin fan, okay. and his last book that he did not finish was made into a documentary called I Am Not Your Negro, mm -hmm. okay. and I believe it's streaming live now, on, it's streaming on uh, Amazon Prime, um, and, and it, it, there, is a, there is a very nice history of race in America from his point of view, it talks about a number of the books he wrote with I Am Not Your Native Son to, you know, what, what happened on Beale Street. Um, I also just picked this up. It's by Ibram X. Kendi, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Right. It is really good. And this, mm -hmm. this guy is, um, you know, amazing. couldn't get a 20, 20 on his ACT, he said. 
and, and ends up now, he, he just moved from American University, I think, to Boston University, and he's the head of the Anti-Racism Institute there at BU. So I will add those two to our list. Um, and as we conclude, once again, I'd really like to thank Mr. Lindley for taking the time on a Sunday afternoon and um, to agree so quickly. I think I emailed you and like two, within the day you made yourself available. So we really appreciate that. Thank you to our community for attending. And just a quick reminder, please stay engaged, complete the census if you haven't already, and then vote because voting is, um, I think the ultimate game changer. Um, as we conclude, if you have any um, take home messages before um, we conclude, I, I'd ask you to share them now. And before Samina people get off, um, as we said that the conversation will not stop here and the work will continue from here going forward. So if there is a particular conversation you want to have, either around the resources that um, we've given you or uh, you know a topic and a perspective that you would like to hear i think one thing that we've talked about is um you know engaging uh as you may know the six individual seven individuals that organized the protests and all of the work in mason where thousands of people showed up and was one of the most effective and organized uh, events I've been to were seven young women from, you know, their late teens. And so I think we want to engage that population in our conversation as a future session. But if you have other things that you would like to see, um, we would very much uh, like to hear that um, and uh, continue to reach out and do at minimum those four things that Nathaniel has. I mean, they really, they cover uh, the whole gamut, really, if you look at it in terms of our ability to have an impact on systemic change. And um, thank you, Samina, for, uh, for hosting and keeping us on track. And thank you, Nathaniel, for you know, being a part of this. And so um, we realized as we were conversing that we have so much more in common than, uh, than even we realized. And so um, this work is, is a responsibility on upon all of us. So as we conclude, I will um, we'll end with Mr. Lampley and his closing thoughts. Um, it is important work for all of us. As much as I abhor labels, and, and, and this, this book here, How to Be an Anti-Racist, um, Dr. Kendi posits that you are, he says there's no middle ground. It's not enough to say that I am not a racist. You have to be an anti-racist or in his judgment, perhaps you are a racist because you are allowing things to happen that perhaps you could change. I'm not calling anybody a racist. I don't like that term. That's a very serious accusation, but that's what he says. And what I take from that is, when I think about the events that have happened in my lifetime and before my life in the last 400 years of this country, I'm not at all concerned today with how we got here. It helps to have some history so that we can define the problem, but I'm not looking to point fingers and, and lay blame. What I am looking to do is to inspire people to want to make change and to want to do the right thing. So from that standpoint, even though I'm not inclined to blame anyone, I will say that if you are not doing things to help with this trans transformational change that we all want, then perhaps you are a part of the problem and you don't even know it. And again, I'm not laying blame on anybody. I wanna look forward. I'm not looking back, and we all have an opportunity to be a part in this transformational change. Thank you so much again, um, and I hope this is a lot, not the last time that we see you. Um, once we get out of this social distancing and are up and running, um, we hope to see you a lot more at our center in Westchester, inshallah, God willing. So, Thank you.
Thank you so much to everyone. Um, please enjoy the rest of the day. It looks like the rain has finally stopped. So thank you again. Thank you, Shakila. Thank you. Thanks, Samina. Thank you, Nathaniel. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.